Hello everybody and welcome along to a brand new video where today I'm continuing my classic Doctor Who reviews going right back through from the very very early days through eventually to all of classic Who and New Who and whatever. This week we've reached a probably not so well known story I think from the Patrick Troughton era but one I really wanted to talk about because I actually really really enjoyed the story and it is The Faceless Ones. So yes, this is a story, the penultimate story in season four of Doctor Who, the 1966-67, I believe, season, Patrick Troughton's first sort of season as the Doctor. Um, and this is a story that I never really knew anything about going into it. Like, I feel like a fair amount of Patrick Troughton's stories, you kind of have, it's either got Daleks in the title or Cybermen in the title, or you're just aware of the main monsters, or it's got the Ice Warriors or even like the Yeti and the Great Intelligence, like there's a lot of kind of iconic sort of monsters that are returned again in future episodes and therefore you at least have a rough idea of what's going to happen in the story because you know what the who the villain is and what it is. Um, whereas with the Faceless Ones, I didn't I didn't know anything. I didn't even know this story was set at Gatwick Airport until I read the synopsis saying about Gatwick Airport. It was just one of those stories that had always kind of passed me by. Only two episodes exist so it was harder to kind of there was just generally going to be less sort of chit chat around it. I think there's no there's no proper DVD release or anything like that. So it wasn't a story that I really had any expectations going into it. I just didn't really know what was going to happen. And that's actually quite exciting. It's kind of like, even though this story is 52 years old, it's still like, I'm watching it for the very first time. I've never seen it before. And it's like completely new to me and it's 52 years old. It's, it's kind of crazy, but also kind of brilliant being able to still watch this sort of classic stuff and have it completely fresh and new to me. And so yes, and, and I wasn't planning to review this story because I knew nothing about it, but then I watched it and I enjoyed it so, so much that I just had to come and talk about it. So yes, right from the off, this story sort of engaged me straight away. Obviously, I, a really nice setting of Gatwick Airport. I, I live, for a hint for guys, I live very, very close to Gatwick Airport. When I used to commute to London, I would go through past Gatwick Airport every single day. I only live about a 15, 20 minute drive from it. So um, it's kind of very much a local place for me. It's quite rare for Doctor Who to have sort of set, set very, very locally to me, even closer than London, which it often is obviously set in. Um, so that was already quite exciting and just see, and for them to actually get out and do some local location filming on runways at Gatwick Airport and things like that. That was all really, really cool. I think it's some of the sort of best early sort of black and white Doctor Who location filming that we have. Um, it's just a really sort of, yeah, something a little bit, a very different sort of setting to have it for. And just I think gives that sort of the extra scale of the story, really establishing a setting and a location to build this story from at such a sort of famous airport, a big place like Gatwick Airport. And, and a, a a sort of idea you'd never really tackled before, sort of setting a story in an airport up to this point, that's never happened in Doctor Who, so that was already quite exciting. And then just this whole concept around chame the, the chameleon people and chameleon tours, and just there was a lot of just trying to sort of understand and work out what's going on, and there's lots of kind of gradual build up to revelations, you're getting hints at what's actually going on as we start to realise what the chameleons are, that obviously they're the race that are cloning humans, um, and then finding out about what Chameleon Tours actually does, they're supposedly taking away young people, what they're actually doing with them, finding out that it's the plane that's actually the one that's sort of transferring them, miniaturising them, and then being able to take them up to this magic satellite where the chameleons are up in space. Um, it just it just felt like one of those stories where it kept on kind of surprising me. It wasn't completely obvious. Obviously, of course, the sort of cloning of humans thing was fairly apparent from very, very early on, but that wasn't really meant to be too hidden. But just explaining exactly what was going on with the chameleons and sort of all the backstory behind that was really kind of um, well built up, I thought, throughout this story and really kind of engaged me and wanted me to keep on watching to find out exactly what on earth is going on here. Of course, we don't really see much of the actual sort of alien race, shall we say, of the chameleons. Um, we see a little bit of it at the end of episode one and a little bit in episode six. But other than that, they're very much the sort of human clone versions of it that we see rather than the sort of original versions of them, the faceless ones, as they're actually called. Although we, all the episodes called the faceless ones, we actually see very, very little in two and a half hours of story. We probably see about six or seven minutes of actual screen time of the faceless ones. But I don't think that's a massive problem because the, the aliens themselves aren't exactly the most spectacular. They don't talk. They don't seem to really do very much. So it, it, there isn't really much you can do with them in their sort of former state. So it, I think it's better kind of having them having them in this sort of cloned human evil mastermind kind of state that we see a fair few of them. They're all the sort of classic sinister Doctor Who villains that are all looking quite shady, having sort of serious conversations in, in, and whatnot. It just, it just, I don't know, this story just really felt like a proper kind of classic Doctor Who story, a kind of like almost 70s Doctor Who story, I think, more than the 60s. I think I'm really noticing this compared to the William Hartnell era, which very, very, very much feels like its own era. It feels out on its own and sort of individual to the rest of Doctor Who, of Classic Who, of New Who, but the rest of Doctor Who. Whereas as I'm going through the Patrick Troughton era, 
it's very much kind of I'm feeling a lot of these stories feel like they could fit into the John Pertwee era or into the Tom Baker era. They've just I think got more of a sci-fi aspect to it. I, it's, it's kind of hard to explain tangibly what it is about these stories but just watching it maybe even if it's the way it's filmed I think they started I can't remember you can probably tell me in the comments below guys when they started using the sort of different cameras because I know it used to be the 405 line um, cameras in the very very early 60s sort of for the, for the early William Hartnell stuff when did they move over to the, the I can't even remember what, what cameras they are but the the better cameras that they used comparatively at least that they used in certainly in the 70s um, and the 80s for all the studio footage and things like that um, do let me know if you know in the comments below exactly when that happened because it very much feels like I think that might be a part of it just the look of it sort of looks more like a black and white 70s story than a black and white 60s story, um, a normal 60s sort of William Hartnell story. So that's that I think is helping to kind of engage me more because the 70s has always been my favourite classic Who era. And so to have what I never really realised is that a lot of the Patrick Troughton stories kind of feel like they could fit into that era a bit more. Um, it's really kind of increasing my enjoyment of of all these all these stories of, of the Patrick Troughton era. And yes, so as I was saying about the sort of chameleon, I think the whole chameleon tours idea is fantastic. Obviously a great kind of plot to be able to tie in to have the whole reason behind sitting in an airport and things like that. Having it at some sort of shady air, budget airline for young people to send them off to different places. Um, but in reality is obviously kidnapping them all and you know kind of sort of use them and in the future to sort of convert all their people into them and everything like that. That's all really, really clever idea. A sort of just not sort of what we normally kind of get from Doctor Who. So just a different setting, a different way of doing things with Doctor Who. It meant you could have lots of great footage of sort of massive planes and things like that, interior of a plane and an airport, all these just, just sort of different iconography that you can really include in a story like this, which set elsewhere wouldn't necessarily be as exciting. But I think adding this in really just turns it into a great idea. And up to this point, we haven't really seen hardly any of sort of cloned or duplicate people or anything like that. Of course, we get a few more in the 70s. Think of the Zygons or the Android Invasion, um, things like that. Those that there's a little bit more sort of cloning in, in Doctor Who to come. But at this point, it's a fairly, I think within Doctor Who, at least a new idea that we don't really experience very, very often. So it's kind of nice to see it being sort of brought out in this story and having to figure out um, how where, where the originals are and things like that as well and trying to work that out and just sort of how they're actually really really good copies usually they're kind of rubbish they're not they kind of there's always a fault with the copies but in this in this version the copies are actually really really good and it's only the band on their arm that actually sort of dis distinct sort of tells you can tell who they that they are the sort of duplicate and not the original so I thought yeah it was really really sort of clever and effectively done there tying it all into the chameleon tours idea as well the chameleons who aren't really really they're not sort of evil as such they just want to survive and they're doing anything they can to survive they're doing what their director told them to do to survive um which then by the end of the story obviously they realize is not the right way to go the doctor manages to kind of sort of sort things out diplomatically and then say he's going to help them out in the future as well in there as they sort of have to try and survive from this this faceless state that they've become in how they can kind of take some form on again um so it's quite it's kind of quite nice to have it as they're not sort of all out evil beings and everything they are actually just trying to survive which often which is we get in a fair amount of doctor that it's actually the villain isn't that evil in the end it's more just a sort of want to survive or things like that and so i think that's quite nicely realised in this story as well. I guess one of the criticisms of this story is Ben and Polly because they are just sort of offloaded at the beginning of the story when they randomly get out the TARDIS in the middle of Gatwick Airport runway and for some reason all run off in different directions. Well then let's get back in the TARDIS and fly off somewhere else. No, let's run off in different directions. Then Polly and Ben disappear at the end of episode one and that's basically all we see of it, see of them apart from the very end of episode six in a previous sort of previously filmed location bit of filming for them to say goodbye. Fairly randomly they're just like actually no we're home now, we're bored of this, bye have a little sad, just a little tear and then that's it and move on. So they were a little bit, I feel a little bit badly underserved in this story because they were just kind of forgotten about and then written out at the very end of the story. Um, obviously they wanted to move on to new companions and that's fine, but it would be nice to give them a better exit, particularly as Dodo's exit, the previous companion to leave, was also a terrible exit. Um, when she left it was really quite bad and so to have then the next set of companions leaving in a pretty rubbish way as well it's just a little bit disappointing it shows they kind of didn't quite know how to write out companions so well I think at this stage compared to some of the stuff we get well it's obviously it's a mixed bag throughout Classic Who really but some of the ones thinking of like Joe Grant and people like that have a better exit um, from the show whereas yeah it's a little bit disappointing in this particular story. Of course this story is only has two episodes that exist and so episodes one and episode three and then episodes two and four to six are all reconstructed we've got the soundtracks this sort of telesnap so that was the way I had to try and watch it I think it did help me being having two full episodes to be able to watch obviously watching off the Lost in Time DVD box set I really hope that when eventually we get around to releasing the blu-ray collection box sets of 
the sort of black and white series that the the stories that are on the Lost in Time box set, the episodes are really not restored at all well. There's a lot of sort of fuzziness and grain and sort of bits of damage to the picture and things like that. There's just a lot of sort of moments where they clearly haven't had because it's quite an old box set, it's 15 years old, they didn't put that much effort into the restoration of every single episode. So there's definitely a lot more to sort of come from the quality of those of those particular story, of those particular episodes that are sort of orphaned onto this box set. And I hope that we get that in the future. But they definitely gave me a good enough kind of glimpse into visually what the story looked like um, and really kind of were, were two really engaging episodes. But I also have to give a shout out to the loose canon reconstruction of this story, which I think is really, really effective. They do a really good job of using sort of reused bits of footage from episodes one and three that fit really sort of well into the sort of rest of the story, but don't, and don't feel like it is just repeating the same footage, even though it is. And there's some also really nice animation in there for when the the, um, the plane's going up to meet the satellite, that's all animated and everything. Of course, it's a fairly basic animation, but it does just add that slightly visual engaging element to it, which I think is really, really well done. Given the budget that was probably next to nothing that Loose Cannon had, I think they did a really, really good job of it. And it just helped to make the story more enjoyable because I felt able to still engage even when it's just the sort of stills and the soundtrack and everything like that. So as a package, I was actually able to really, really enjoy this story, even with only two episodes existing. So yes, overall, The Faceless Ones is a surprising story. I didn't know anything about it going in and I had no reason to expect it would be amazing, but no reason to expect it would be terrible either. And I thoroughly enjoyed this story. It's definitely one of my probably one of my favourite Patrick Troughton stories so far, I think. It's just really got sort of all the ingredients is a story that doesn't feel too slow. It's kind of zipping along quite well. There's lots of reveals and explanations of things happening. There's a good sort of core plot about with the comedians and their idea of cloning people and everything. That's a good, a genuinely good idea at a great setting creating an overall really, really good story. But what about you guys? What did you think of the Faceless Ones? Are you, do, did you know as much about it, as uh, sort of as little about it when you first saw it as I did? Uh, hopefully if you have watched this far and um, you have seen the story before, because otherwise I've kind of ruined it for you. Um, so apologies if I have ruined it for you, but hopefully you would have stopped by now and gone and actually watched it because you definitely should, because it is a fantastic story. But do let me know your thoughts on it down in the comments below. But other than that guys, remember to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new here, and I'll see you again very soon for another video. Goodbye.